All right, so welcome back. This is our fourth, well, I'm not, count, now count, not counting correctly. This is session number three of the whole session. And it's entitled The Design Patterns. So again, if you just go visit to the notebooks and open up your 03 Design Patterns and Advanced Queries, this is the notebook for you. And as the name suggests, we're going to talk about some design patterns, which is basically looking into stuff we already designed, the, the pipeline for the single electrode processing, as well as some existing other pipeline. And basically kind of study, study a general pattern of how you actually, like some similarities, some common things that occurs over and over when you design a pipeline. And this is where we also get to talk about some fancy terminologies, like one-to-one, -one, one to many and get an idea of like when something like that could be useful for you. And then after that, it's more of like this open session of query exercises. So I have a bunch of queries that I'm going to ask you to try to complete. So it actually kind of works out perfectly that we have a bit of like free long time at the end. I want you to kind of really try and see if you can come up with that query. All right, so design patterns. So again, first thing first, let's just import our pipeline. This time, again, now I've provided you with the session tree workshop thing to import from. This provides the whole definition of all the tables you defined from previous session. So that's mouse, session, neuron, activity, statistics, spike detection param, and spikes. And this should also kind of raise your appreciation that you actually have created quite a few tables today. So your pipeline is starting to look like something. Now we're also going to go ahead and import this other package called workshop.calcium. And I'm going to alias it as CA for short for calcium. And this implements a uh, fairly full-fledged, but still, you know, simplified version of a calcium uh, experiment, so a multi-photon experiment on the calcium traces. So let's actually look at them. It's usually a pretty good idea to look at your pipeline by first taking a look at the ERD. So for your own schema, you've already seen this actually quite a few times by now. You have two manual tables, the mouse and session. You have an imported table neuron, which imported the data from an external file, hence the import it. And then based on it, you computed the activity statistics, which is stored in the computed table called activity statistics. You've also then defined a table to store the result for spike detection. So this is the spikes table. But you also wanted to make sure you have a flexible parameterization. So you define a spike detection param as a lookup table and your spikes table depend, dependent on both the neuron and spike detection param, such that any valid combination between the two can be an entry in spikes table. OK, so that's your single electrode experiment on mouse. Now let's take a look at the ERD for calcium. OK, so this is what it looks like. It doesn't even fit in a single screen. So it's considerably larger, at least has way, quite a few more tables compared to what we have. But some things will start to look familiar. At least some of the patterns are not too different. And it's precisely these similarities that I kind of would like to highlight as we go through the design pattern part of this discussion. OK, so one thing I would like you to notice between the two, so I'm just going to scroll back and forth between the two. Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, is this the next um, More or less, it should be fairly deterministic. Do you see it quite differently? <laughs> it, it does generate on the fly. It's usually is quite, I see. So perhaps there's a difference. Okay, I actually don't have a great explanation. I haven't really seen that much variation, so maybe uh, Dimitri will check it out. Information should be correct, but indeed the rendering could be different, although we haven't really seen much variations. Yeah, is it still the same? And it's still correct, right? It's still correct. It's uh, portrayed slightly differently. <laughs> OK, well, that's a curveball. All right, so one thing I want you to notice in those, both of these two tables is that it starts with mouse, right? So you see that both of them starts with mouse. Our pipeline started with mouse. And also, the calcium pipeline starts at the very top with mouse. And this pattern of seeing mouse, or actually more broadly speaking, experimental subjects appearing at the very top of your pipeline is a 
pretty common thing to the point that whenever I or Dimitri, and as far as I know, or Jake, we go and design pipeline for ourselves or other people, usually the very first table we're just gonna go create almost blindly would be a table for subject. It could be mouse, right? Or if you work with human subject, then you have something like subject. And this, if you think about it, kind of makes sense because that's usually the particular thing that most of your experimental question revolves around. That's the first, usually the first thing you can enter whenever you're about to put information about your experiment is what is the subject of your study? So it's very common that your subject, for example, mouse, appears at the very top because that's really where the data entry and hence the processing down the data pipeline begins. That being said, this is not the set and fixed rule. You could definitely come up with cases where this is not gonna be true. For example, if you actually wanna classify each mouse according to different labs that it belongs to, maybe you're developing a pipeline for multiple labs. In this case, you, then the first start point becomes something like labs. You have a listing of different labs and your mouse might be defined by which lab this is from and what's the ID. So in that case, you'll find lab table to be the very top table and then comes the mouse. But the key is that this top, what starts your pipeline is almost always a good reflection of what's the first thing you have to enter into your data pipeline. Okay. All right, so that's kind of what I wanted to say about the mouse. The next thing I do want to say is, uh, so there are a couple of things I'm going to cover in this portion is talk about design patterns. I'm going to also show some neat tricks about the ERD. Just a very sh a small glimpse at it. So for example, let's actually look at the relationship between mouse and session and then session and neuron. So okay, let me actually first show if I, what happens if I do ERD on each table. So in the past we've been doing ERD on schema which shows the whole schema. If you do ERD on a single table, it only shows that table, which is kind of boring, right? But you can actually say, okay, I want to see the ERD for both mouse and session. You can add the session to ERD. It's a bit funny syntax. If you did this, now it shows ERD including both the mouse and session. There are a couple more neat tricks and some, some of weird tricks about ERD. For example, I can say, okay, I want to start with the mouse. But I want to see everything that depends on mouse, like one step down, well, you say plus one. If you say plus two, it goes down two steps. If you say plus three, it goes down three steps. So I'm just kind of giving you a fun overview of what ERD is capable of doing. Uh, it has also weird properties, like if I say plus three, which gives me all the way to spikes, minus one, now it starts tracing back upward after three steps. So I now finally see my spike detection param. But this is not the same thing as plus two. So this means uh, this ERD logic is non-associative, but uh, you know, that's just to confuse you. Anyway, so the whole point was to actually look at the mouse plus session, which I have a duplicate here, so I'm just gonna run this one. And now I also wanna compare it to session to neuron relationship. So aside from the table theory differences, which you're already aware of, what do you see different between the two ERDs? So I think it was you asked this very question. So now what do you see the difference between the two uh, ERDs? So one-to-one -one session and neuron. That's right, so he already knows what this means. Uh, basically I was looking for one looks thicker than another, right? So th there's thin line and there's a thick line. So what does it mean, right? So I kind of already answered this ahead in the earlier session, but the thin line would be something we'll call one to many, and thick line is what we'll call one to one. So let's actually revisit this a bit and think more carefully about it, sorry. So think about the, let's talk about the one to many first, the mouse to session. So per, mou per, uh, per mouse, you can have more than one session, right? And this is actually made possible because session not only depends on mouse and uh, therefore have the primary key of the mouse, but they also have an extra attribute called session date. This very extra attribute allows you to have not, like the mouse not be the only thing to uniquely identify, the mouse being not enough to identify a session. Meaning per mouse, by changing the session date, you could have multiple entries in session. 
So by this additional attribute in the primary key that the session has, it has become this one-to-many relationship. Per mouse, you can have more than one session. Now, it doesn't mean you, don't, you have to always have a session. There's no even guarantee there will be a single session. But when you have a session, you could definitely have more than one. Now, the session to neuron relationship is different. If you recall back, what was the definition of the neuron? Uh, neuron was actually defined per session because we know that neuron only depends. So let me actually look at the. So here's the definition I can pull up again. It doesn't really show dependency as is. Hmm? I'll oh, describe, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's how describe, yeah. Yeah, that's probably better. So if you actually hover over, eventually the thing comes up. There, okay. So here it shows the neuron depends on session, and that's the only thing that's present in the primary key. This suggests that a neuron is uniquely determined by knowing the session it came from. So, and another way to look at it is that there's no other attributes present in the primary key aside from ones that's coming from the session. This makes session to neuron a one-to-one -one relationship. So again, you can, you, it's possible for you to not have a neuron for a session. That is a possibility. You could be having missing entries. Maybe you don't have a neuron recorded. Maybe the file goes missing. You don't have that particular entry. But you can, when you have a neuron, you can never have more than one neuron per session. So that's a one-to-one -one relationship. Yeah. You Based on the way we defined it. No, that's completely correct. So that, that's why I'm saying this was always, that's what the critical point when you're designing the experiment. If I've been actually fairly consistent, at the very beginning I said, per session, I never record from more than one neuron. I know it's weird. I think every experimenter would disagree with that approach. Or I might, it actually depends, but. So in my case, that was my design criteria. I knew that per session, there's going to be at most one neuron. Hence, I know that a neuron could be uniquely determined by knowing the session. So what would you do to, to make multiple neurons per session? OK. Yeah, so that just so it's picked up by the thing as well. So yes, the question then becomes, if you disagree with this, or if you think like, OK, I can record from more than one neuron per session, how would you redesign this? What could be a change? say, in the neuron table that could accommodate the difference. What would you do? Would you change anything about the primary key attribute? I mean, any, anyone's free to answer this question, actually. Otherwise, Dimitri gets to answer it. Sure, yes, indeed. So if, what, for example, what would you include? So the mouse of session was mouse inherited, and then you add a session date to have this additional flexibility of one to many. So if you want multiple neuron per session, you inherit from session, but you also want to add something else, right? So perhaps what could be there? So the key is you still have to be able to uniquely identify every single neuron. So, and you have to be able to know what it will take to do so. If session is not enough, you need to have something else that together with that, you can uniquely identify every and any neuron. Yes, exactly. So something like neuron number or maybe neuron ID. So it could just be an emulation thereof. Like maybe if you recorded 10, you're just going to go from 0 to 9, find 1 to 10 maybe. Um, but with that additional attribute, now you can uniquely identify and describe each and every neuron. So you have basically turned this one-to-one -one relationship between session and neuron into one-to-many relationship with the knowledge that you could have more than one neuron per session. So just to reiterate, the whole design here that I made was very simplistic, actually quite intentionally done to give this one-to-one -one very artificial case. Um, so if it conforms, if this is exactly a good description of how you'll be recording, this works fine. But if you ever decide that you actually want to record more than one neuron per session, obviously this will no longer work because a neuron session is no longer identifying enough of neuron. Yes. Uh, that's, a great, that's a good question. So it depends. So th this also largely depends on like, okay, how is the imported, gonna, like what's the data gonna look like? So say like now instead of being a single row of data or single vector or some, like 1D array, the data file contain 
like multiple roles, right? And the, multiple, the number of roles obviously now correspond to different neuron types. So one thing I've done, so sorry, I'm gonna jump to the previous notebook to highlight this point. So here, in fact, in the neuron table is where I wanna discuss this. Is that it? Yeah, there's it. So you notice that per make, which gets called for every parent, so even if it's the case that, say, we added another attribute here, so say we're now thinking, okay, this is probably gonna be something like neuron ID, maybe an integer, right? And neuron ID, neuron index, you could also call. You're gonna get the make call for every parent table or combination of parent tables. Since there's only one parent table session, it doesn't change the fact the session, the make for this neuron table is gonna get called once per entry in session. But here what we want to do is per session, you probably have multiple neurons. So what you could do the case is that you could still load the one file that corresponds to a particular session. But you imagine the data file, data is now gonna be multiple, or multiple length array, or sorry, multi-dimensional array, or two-dimensional array with one dimension indicating how many neurons you have. I've been inserting one, right? I've been doing self-insert one because there's been only one entry that I needed to compute per make call. But if you actually have multiple entries you have to compute and insert, nothing really prevents you from just going and do that. So in this case, I know I'm just gonna on the fly code here, right? And this is not gonna work because the shape is not correctly done. But say I assume that data actually had two, a shape of two and the first dimension tells me how many neurons there are. I could do something like this. And I could say, for that one particular activity, actually I should say, so I'm also gonna get the index according to the position, so I'm gonna enumerate. And this is not gonna run, so I'm just gonna do this just to demonstrate, D. And now I have this extra field that's missing, the neuron ID has to be given, so I'm just gonna say that's gonna be the index, the data is that particular entry, and I can say self, insert one of the key, and so you see that within, and then the rest will just disappear. So within the make, you're actually inserting multiple entries of neuron. And this is completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So this would be one logic by which you could actually have per, per like one parent entry, the make is getting code on, you could actually end up resulting in multiple child entries. Okay, I hope that like this live coding didn't confuse too many people. Good? All right, so that's the one too many. I'm really glad this comes up because it's actually gonna come up tomorrow. All right, so that's a one to one and one too many. Mm, so yes, okay, so another point I wanted to just discuss was the use of lookup tables. Um, it's really not too much I wanted to say about this beyond what you already described, but I just wanted to say that this pattern of you want to perform some computation but and usually you know or like you know where to get the data source or like the target of the computation about. For example, if you're computing spikes, you know spikes will be computed per neuron, for example. So you know that you definitely want to depend on neuron, right? You want to compute spikes per neuron. Spike depends on neuron for sure. But then oftentimes a lot of the computational algorithms you're gonna implement, therefore the result and hence the resulting spikes or resulting computation actually depends heavily on some parameters about the algorithm. Now this could be really like a regular parameter like threshold which literally tweaks something about your algorithm or it could even be a classification of different algorithm types. For example, you could actually imagine there are different spike detection algorithms altogether which uses entirely different method. So when you actually design your algorithm and implement the result and represent it as a table, it's always a good idea to think, of, think a bit ahead about what are some of the parameters you're using and think whether it actually makes sense to already have that as a lookup table. Even if it's the case that you feel fairly certain about certain parameter values you're using, this, by doing this, you, can, you actually allow yourself the flexibility of adding different parameter configurations in the future and some flexibility. And this also kind of goes in hand in hand with the policy that I strongly adhere to is of non-hard coding. 
Oftentimes, if you have an algorithm and in your code you have some magical numbers, so we call these magical numbers, right? If I say my algorithm had 0.5 appear out of nowhere, that's a magical number. And it's often confusing whether it's how special this number is. Was it something that just, you know, some postdoc from the past like tweak and eventually figure out this is the number to use? Or maybe it's like something more derived and there's a reason it has to be exactly that number. So by actually breaking it apart into a parameter table, you can actually make an explicit statement that this is more or less a parameter that's been found to work rather than being a number that everyone must completely follow. And also in every, any case in the future, if you have to think about where, what are some of these meanings of the numbers, having as a separate table with description given what these numbers do or numbers are about can actually be pretty helpful. So that's more of my like, two cents when it comes to designing your computed table is consider having a breakout of a lookup table. You can even have multiple lookup tables. You don't, nothing prevents you from having multiple lookup table, each housing different sets of parameters, and your final computer table depending on all of them. Data Gen will happily find every single possible combination of them and populate your downstream table for every one of those combinations. And things like that becomes very useful, for example, in the case of machine learning. So I will actually briefly touch on this topic. If you're designing a new architecture, or maybe you're just simply trying different neural network architecture or some machine learning algorithm. Oftentimes there are many so-called hyperparameters, things that dictates the architecture that you want to try different values of. And you might not from the get-go know exactly what's the right combination. By making those hyperparameters into a lookup table or lookup tables, depending on how those structure work, you allow yourself the flexibility of having define whole combinations of different hyperparameters, and you could literally perform a hyperparameter search using just simple colon populate. Okay? So that was my two cents on computed tables and use of lookup tables. Any questions? Good. All right, and I think this is the one uh, I, should, I definitely wanted to cover, is this question that once in a while comes up of like, why don't I just create a one big table that contains everything? Like what, why not, right? So for example, for all the data we have in the mouse and session and neuron, you could imagine combining them into this one big spreadsheet of every column present. And I mean, at least I generated this off of the data we had and I tweak it such that it becomes like this. Indeed, it ha you can claim that everything you have in mouse session and neuron are found in here. The problem, at least one, a couple problems we see about this is that, first of all, let's actually go by what we notice about these kind of uh, tables. And it's actually pretty common to see tables like that if you're using, say, one big Excel spreadsheet to contain every single data. At least I can definitely claim to have seen a lot of this in my pre-data joint days. Well, one is you tend to have a lot of repeated entries. So for example, okay, mouse ID being fine, but like your date of birth is repeated every time the same mouse appears, right? So mouse ID 00 appears, so date of birth is repeated twice, 100 appears twice, so hence the date of birth, as well as the sex appears twice. So that's, there's gonna be a lot of repetition. If you're actually gonna have 1,000 sessions of mouse, of a particular mouse, you're gonna have 1,000 repetitions of date of birth and sex, which you probably didn't care about, okay? So that's one. And also now, because you forcibly combine everything, you are forced to have some empty columns. So for example, mouse ID one doesn't actually have any session run on it. As a result, in order to still keep all the columns consistent and try to fit in one table, one way I thought about it is like, okay, just leave it blank. People should understand leaving blank means they didn't have anything, right? Well, the problem now is that you're no longer sure what each row really represents. I cannot simply count the number of rows to tell you how many actual sessions I've run. Right? Did I run a total of, how many was this? So five, five, six. Did I run a total of nine sessions? Absolutely not, that's not the case here. I run a total of five sessions. Is this number of mice, nine number of mice I have? No, I don't have nine mice. I only have, I don't know, seven? I think it's seven or so. 
Yeah, seven mice. So you see, what just happened in my head was basically I had to look at the rows and actually parse it. In order to answer a simple question of how many sessions do I have, I have to basically look at a field that should be present for session. For example, session date, and just count the number of rows that has something in it, and then I can finally tell you how many sessions I have. If I want to tell you how many mice I have, I have to now actually go look at the mouse ID and keep track of the duplicates. I already see zero, so I'm only going to count it once, such and such. So if you use table like this, you might feel like, okay, I'm using data join because I'm using table. But no, you're really not using, you're not, you're not gaining any benefits out of this because you are now reduced to having to parse your data again. And this is primarily coming from the fact that you have completely lost the meaning of each role. Your table no longer has a consistent definition or representation of any entity per role. It's really hard to say what this table represents. So is there anything else else? Yeah, that's the big point about the, like, what it represents portion. So as I've been throughout the whole workshop today, one thing I've been stressing is to think of each table as representing a thing or category of things, right? So we thought about mouse as a table where each row is a mouse, or we thought about a session where each row is a session. And we also thought about spikes, where each row is a spike set for a particular neuron. So this way, each row of a table, and hence, as a result, the whole table becomes a consistent representation of something you work with. And it's really easy to say what it's representing. It makes your query much easier. And overall, much less parsing that's necessary, and far less repetition that's necessary. So that's one point I wanted to bring. And when I usually talk about this, the one uh, question I get is, but don't you have joins? Like, don't act like you cannot join tables. Well, true, but if I join tables, look what I get. I don't have any missing entries. And you might claim, well, but mouse ID zeros and tens, hundreds are repeated. Sure, it's repeated, but it's, not, it's because each entry or each row of this final query result is no longer representing mouse it's actually representing a valid session neurons and session combinations. So each entry has a consistent meaning. As a result, it's still very easy to work with it. And you notice that any of the mice for which I don't have sessions or neurons recorded for, it's not present in here. This only leaves behind a valid entry that you can consistently work with and reliably write computations and analysis on. All right, so that's kind of enough about this like, high-level overview and thought processes of how you go about design, uh, designing pipelines and coming up with the different design patterns. I think I would like to spend the rest of the, this workshop session basically making you think about queries. Because if, it was, if you're not populating stuff, if you're not just calling populate, then rest of the time, we're, like, us data joint users spend our time quilling data. So query is a very big portion of it. This is where you act as a scientist to ask questions, ask and look for particular data entries and relationships. And sometimes it is a query that really gives you insight into your data. So it's very useful and pretty fun skills to horn in. So what I have and what I would like to do is basically ask you to go ahead and try these challenges out. Uh, maybe not like all at once, but perhaps you can try these, uh, let's see. Let's actually try these four challenges, and I really urge that you give it a shot. Like it's really by trying that you actually finally get an idea of how useful this can be. So I'll give you a couple minutes. And if you have questions, this is also like just call us in. Like we'll like we'll love answering questions about this. It's just so you can get better insights into the thing, and we can easily go around. All right, so how many of you are done now? Raise your hands. All right, so, yeah, OK. Should we go over, or do some of you really one more time? OK, I don't, I don't hear objections, so I'll just go ahead and uh, start working on this, right? So for those of you who've you know, successfully completed it, I will really appreciate if you can like, shout out your answer well, as I ask stuff. Uh, I think that will make it at least more interactive. And uh, I do want to avoid just pointing to pretty people because as an audience, I usually don't enjoy that kind of stuff myself. 
So, okay, so we're working, let's do the first one, right? So which spike set has spike counts of 25 or more? So what would you start with? Spikes, yeah, so I say spikes, and then what? And, awesome, and then what? Yeah, count, did I say count or counts? Count, right? Uh, off. Yeah? Is it good or am I, or am I wrong? Greater than equal to, yeah, indeed. Okay, so those are the spike counts greater than equal to 25. Okay, that's, that's good. Okay, now let's build it up, right? So next one would be neuron, which neuron had spike counts of 25 or more? So what would you start with? Neuron. I'm asking about neurons, so you probably want neuron. And, yeah, this one here. Yeah, how do I put it in? Control V, is that it? Parenthesis. What would happen if I don't put parenthesis? Is it gonna be fine or do you think it's gonna error out? You think it's fine? Oh, let's try it, right? It errors out because it says, and it's usually this is like ridiculously long error, but at the very end it says unknown column count. It's because it basically sequentially applies the restriction. It basically says find neurons for which you have spikes, and then for the, among those neurons, find the one that count is greater than equal to 25, and data joint would be like, neuron doesn't have a column called count. So yeah, I mean, I know you guys were already telling me you want to put parentheses. You want to restrict the spikes first because that's where the count information is. So find spikes that has count of greater than or equal to 25, and then find neurons that corresponds to those restricted spikes. Yeah. All right, so even more build up, or at least in a different direction. Which mouse had neurons with spike counts of 25 or more? All right, so first thing will be mouse, and probably, right, and what, and then what? what? What would I do here? Do I go, so if I'm repeating my pattern, I almost think like, do I just copy this and paste it in parentheses? Yeah? Oh, you could try that. Take this, you know, put in parentheses. Okay, so basically it says, find neurons for which spikes, find neuron corresponding to spikes for which a count was greater than 25 and restrict them, I found mice that has, that corresponds to those neurons. I mean, almost literally reads like the one we had. Okay, I mean, that should run, it runs. Ah, uh, uh, you can basically just say, oops, I should have deleted the entire parenthesis, this can die. This says, find mouse for which spike count is greater than 25. Gives the same result. So this is the benefit of actual, like, the whole primary key cascading down is that at any level, you can always jump where, however high to identify the corresponding entries. Just because spikes dependent on neuron, that dependent on session, that depend on a mouse, you don't have to sandwich the neurons or sessions if you don't need their information. You can basically say for the spikes, I already always can tell what is the corresponding mouse. So if I restrict down the spikes to the ones I want to, I can then find the corresponding mouse. So you don't have to do this in between. So yes, this was a trick question. This is how you will write it. This is to be the more efficient query. All right, so armed with that, how would you write this one? So what will come first? Yeah, so activity statistics. You're probably starting to get this idea that whenever I say what are something, then that something is the first thing you write. Okay, well, activity statistics, then what? Okay, spike, yeah, so spikes, yeah. Eh, if I can type. So th would this work? Yeah, of course it works. Okay, so hopefully, so this, these sequences were to show that you don't really have to like connect them by putting an extra table in between. 
it, they already know who's connected to what because of the whole dependency chain that you ex ex you know you've been already describing in your pipeline. So if you just go ahead and find a corresponding, it will find the right one. Okay, so that was the first four, and let's see what is what's the next one. Yeah, maybe we'll try the next three in the next uh, five minutes. We'll give it a shot, unless you've already done it. I'll just wait five minutes and then we'll start going over this. So try the next tree before the multiple values thing. All right, are we ready? Someone really one more time? Okay, I'll just go start. All right, so what are the statistics for neurons from female mice? So, what, given the pattern, what would you start with? Activity statistics, yeah, we're asking about statistics. So this is a pattern, like almost an opposite pattern. Earlier we kept on looking something from below, basically restricting by table that came below, like lower in the pipeline. Now we're trying to restrict something lower in the pipeline with the thing having above, or using properties from above. So we want to find all the activity statistics for female mice, well the sex information is found in which table? I think I heard mouse, is it mouse? Yeah, the mouse table, right? So I'm gonna try to first find mouse that is female, which is obviously something we've done before, and then restrict it by this, and that's how we get the activity statistics for female mice. Okay, next one looks a bit more complex. So show me spikes for mouse born after April 10, 2017, uh, using threshold larger than 0 0.5. So, I mean, it's a bit grammatically weird, but it's saying like, Spikes was using thresholds greater than 0 0.5, and the mouse was born on April, t uh, after April 10, 2017. So, there are two parts to this, right? So, obviously, we want to look at spikes, right? We're asking for spikes. And we first of all want to find for which it, the mouse was born after April 10, 2017. So, the Date of birth information is found in mouse, right? So we'll say, okay, so for mouse, that is date of birth is after 2017, April 10th. Okay, and you can already run it, so this gives us some selection. But this is not the only thing we're trying to find. We also want to then, among these, find one for which the threshold was above 0.5. Where would I find the threshold information? Spike detection param. So I will say then where spike detection param where threshold was greater than 0 0.5. Oops, 0 0.5. And those are the four entries corresponding to those two criteria. Okay, the last one is a bit of a curveball. So basically I'm saying like, same thing, except that I do want to see the date of birth, and I do also want to see the threshold. So how could I do that? What is the actual final thing that I'm really asking to look at then? Any idea? Spikes, yeah, but spikes, but you're also interested in looking at the corresponding information in mouse, right? You want to see the date of birth associated with it and the corresponding information in spike detection param because you want to look at the threshold. So you're basically joining these three tables so you can have the whole set of information. And I could actually apply this, this will work fine. But now because I have the whole thing, let's actually just show, so this gives a whole combination of everything. I can just use the attributes present in this table as is without having to go through this sub -quilly kind of thing. We can basically just go ahead, I'm actually gonna be a bit lazy and extract the part that matters as such. Oops, uh, if I know how to remove parentheses, there it goes. And you can verify indeed this is the correct result because it is the same four entries you find from earlier or corresponds to the same four entries. But this time also showing the corresponding mouse information hence you can see the date of birth, and also corresponding spike detection param information, hence you can also see the threshold. So, mm -hmm. 
Ah, uh, yes, that actually is possible. I'll cover that as the very last advanced topic. Yes, but that is definitely possible. Okay, so that's that. And the next one, I think next two, I will show you. Just I will just go ahead and well, actually, the no, next one I do want you to try because I do get pretty full description of what this is. So basically, what I'm saying is that sometimes you want to restrict, but you don't necessarily want to find an exact match. So we cover inequality. So we can do greater than, greater than, equal, and not equal to. But I'm not talking about that. I'm actually talking about exact matches, but from a set. So maybe I want multiple values to match, like to be able to match from one of the multiple values and find any match. So you can do that. All you have to say is the particular attribute in values you're looking for. So the first question is, uh, give me a mouse that is either male or unknown. And so let's just work on that. I'll give you like 30 seconds. Yeah, 30 seconds. All right. So I hope everyone got it. I'll just go ahead and show how this will be done. So I'll find O mouse that has sex of, well, either male or unknown. Now, some of you might argue, like, isn't this just like not female? Right? So same exact result would have come out if I just say, well, sex is not equal to female. Okay, sure, the result's the same, but are they actually asking the same thing? It becomes tricky, right? Because in this case, you know that the female is indeed a complement of the male and unknown. But if you have, say, even yet another value, I don't know, some mixed, perhaps, then you cannot really easily achieve this just by saying not this. So this ability to select based on, like, say it's like it could be one of these values and that's what I'm looking for, becomes pretty convenient. Okay? So next, next one I will show you and I'll actually leave the, this one as a bit of a challenge. So, for, so sometimes what you want to do is match according to pattern. So we so far have been looking more or less based on inequality or exact matches. We just look at multiple values, but still it's somewhat exact match, at least to one of the values. Sometimes we do want to base on patterns. For example, what if I want to find old mouse born in 2016? Now, you might imagine, okay, I could do this by saying like, okay, date of birth is less than 2017-01-01, right? And date of birth is greater than or equal to 2016-01-01. Okay, that's fair. This is correct. This is one approach to do it. But you can also make use of a pattern match and basically just specify the part you care and say, just match anything else. So you can, be, you can say, date of birth, Vike, 2016, and whatever. And it correctly finds those. So this is a pattern match. Uh, percent percent is a bit weird. I have to give you that. Eventually, hopefully within a couple months, we'll fix this or we'll change this so that you only have to use a single percent. But the very moment, you need to say percent percent. If you're using MATLAB, if you happen to be using data join MATLAB, you only need a single percent. So this is a bit of a difference that you could find annoying. I understand. We'll try to fix this. Uh, but the moment is percent percent. It will match any string. Okay, so armed with this knowledge, I want you guys to try for a minute, well, maybe a, a minute, own your ons recorded in May. All right, are you ready? Yeah, okay. All right, so again, you know, same pattern, same. We were looking for neurons, so it probably makes sense to say neurons, right? So recording date is found in which table? Session, 
So I will say neurons for which session was recorded in May. Something like that. And you get that. Okay. Hopefully that made sense. I know the syntax can sometimes look pretty weird, especially when you're doing this uh, pattern matching, but it works. Okay? In this case, we don't have to say session here since it's an editor. Ah, ah, that is completely correct. Session date is part of the neuron, so you actually don't have to say session. That's a good catch. This would have worked. Very nice. All right, so this is the part where I uh, just got a, like, you know, urgent informa information from my code developer that this should no longer be called anti-join. So we actually are calling this what, negative restriction? Yeah, so just so this capture, basically we, um, the bottom line is the anti-join is more of a like old name that was somehow used to describe which somehow really doesn't have anything to do with the join. So the more appropriate term that makes more sense would be to call it something like negative restriction. It's a reverse or it's opposite of restriction. So this, I uh, hope it's pretty straightforward. I'll give you a pause for you to think about this and then I'll just write it out. So all mouse that doesn't have an experiment sessions. Okay, whenever you have this doesn't have or not something, it might be easier to first think about the D case where there's no not and then see how you can reverse it. So at least I will start by saying all mouse that has session would be this. So I'm trying to invert that. Old mouse that doesn't have a session. Okay? Make sense? Yeah, sorry, I couldn't really think of any more interesting like, examples of using a negative restriction, so that's only one case I came up with. All the examples that you had above, you can just say, give me the inverse of that. that yeah, I know, but like that kind of just like, I thought like that's double dipping and I was like too not sure about that. Okay, so the somewhat more interesting and somewhat more complex are these next, well next two. The third one is for bonus. So next two is really this special thing and uh, it does come up, it's quite useful so I did wanna bring about, it is definitely a bit more advanced in the sense that it delves a bit into the special functions provided in your Quilly. And this one I'm introducing here is something called date diff. This, if you pass into dates, it computes difference in number of days. So I will show you what I mean. So here I'm asking, okay, give me sessions that was recorded on mouse that was at least 15 days old. So this is actually fairly more difficult quickly because you don't have the age immediately available anywhere, right? So you know the date of birth. You also know the session date, so you could definitely calculate what's the age at the time of the recording, but nowhere do you have a column that would just simply tells you the age at the recording. Now this is not to say that this was an you know, oversight in our design that we should have included age of the age at the recording. In fact, we recommend against that because you could calculate this. So if I insist this could be calculated, I have to show you how you calculate it. So what you say is, all the sessions, record on the mouse that was all these. So it turns out this will be particularly easiest for me to just first join. So I have two of the attributes I want to use for my calculation in the same place. So this will be present in session and mouse. So this way I have session date and date of birth in one table. And now I say restricted by date diff between session date and date of birth, and that gives you difference in these two dates in number of days, at least, so it's greater than or equal to 15. And that gives me the entries. And you can kind of verify, you can look at it and indeed see that, okay, like if the first mouse was born on March 1st and recorded on May 15th, it's like a month and 15 days or so old, so definitely older than 15 days. And next one is really just a reversal. There's nothing much. Uh, so let's just say how whether we're really like 
going strong and recording from mouse old, uh, younger than two weeks old. Well, looks like we had two mice. In fact, if you look at it, one of them is, uh, well, one of them is like 13 days old, and another is roughly 12 days old, I guess. So date diff is pretty convenient, but it's one of those special functions provided in for use in Quilly. Okay, so before I go to this like glaringly advanced Quilly, uh, let's always do the favorite one. Old mouse that's been recorded by Jacob Reimer. So, old mouse recorded by. So, who, where would I look for experimental information? Session. Is it present in mouse? No. So, I do have to use session. Session where experimenter is equal to. And I'm not going to use like. I want to say make sure that it's exactly him. Yeah. So, he has one mouse that he's recording from. Probably done multiple sessions on it. Okay, so that covers the basics of the Quillies. There's one more operation I do want to cover, and since we do have a decent amount of time, I'm gonna I'm go ahead and cover. Basically, this is one I left at the end in case like if you feel like we're overrunning, then we're not gonna cover this. But we have time, so let's go ahead and talk about it. And it's called projection. So this is one operation that we haven't covered. It's fairly advanced in the sense it's actually quite interesting. Has, it gives you some things to think about. But when you master it, you can actually do a lot of cool things with it. So one way to think about the projection, actually I should do a more due diligence coverage of what projection does. The first thing first, when you actually project a table without saying anything, just project the table, you're actually left with only the primary key. Okay, and this actually holds for if I say on now session, if I project it, I'm only left with the primary key attributes. Okay, I can actually keep some of the attributes by passing them up. So I'll say I want to project and say like okay, so session. So maybe I want to keep the experimenter information. Now you saw that. Now you see that experimenter information is maintained. So projection is really about projecting out unspecified attributes. But notice you can never project out the primary key because the moment you do that, you lose the whole definition and integrity of what is it that you're representing. So the smallest amount of attributes you can have as a result of projection is the primary key attributes. And you can elect to keep any number of other non-primary key attributes. So this is where basically we had a question of like, can you just keep the columns you care about? For example, earlier we had a Quilly where we combine and I say, I also want to see the date of birth and threshold. You can go ahead and project that out. Actually, I can demonstrate that by grabbing it. Where is it? Is this it? That looks like it. So I can grab this whole thing, scroll all the way down, and here I will say, take the whole thing. And I'm just going to go ahead and do all in one place. You can obviously store this first for more mental organization. But you can say project. And here I want to only keep date of birth and threshold. And there it goes. You get the necessary primary key attributes to define and like, identify the entities. So that cannot be projected out. But you can choose to project out any attributes, other non-primary key attributes you're not interested in. Now, one more interesting thing the projection lets you do is actually define a new attribute on the fly. So, for example, say that we actually, so take the example of what we've been working with, the mouse, right? So if I look at the mouse again, sorry, mouse again, you get the date of birth. Maybe you're trying to select mouse at a specific age. How would you go about doing that? Well. One way to do this is to actually use the uh, operator such as now and date diff. So you can basically say something like where, uh, well, let's actually say, I can basically say date diff of now. So now actually gives you the date today and the date of birth. 
And maybe I'm looking for something that's at least 30 days old. So I could do that. And that selects for that particular kind of mass. As she Um, but see, the problem is like, it doesn't give you the final result. It, like, you don't know what the age was. It might actually be more convenient to have an actual explicit age listed. Projection lets you define a new column by using operations such as this. So basically you're saying like, okay, I'm gonna project and I'm gonna define a new field called, or new attribute called age, whose definition would be a difference between now and the date of birth. And this gives it in terms of the number of days. Oh, actually, sorry, now it's not the right one. Oh, what's the number? Do you remember the current date? Today? No. No, now, now, no, that doesn't look correct because, uh, or maybe it's correct. Sorry, maybe I'm actually just mistaking. No, sorry, it's actually completely correct. It's correct, yeah, sorry. Sorry, my confusion. So, yeah, so this way you can actually define a new attribute on the fly. And then you can do queries more like, okay, now that I want the age to be at least, I don't know, let's say 400 days old, or more than 400 days old. So this is a way, so I, you can kind of see this is a bit advanced in the sense now you're kind of going to more of uh, attribute creation on the fly, and, but it's really convenient and this lets you do more complex query formations. on the day the session was performed, sure. Well, I need the session. Can I just call it age? I'll just call it age. Let's not restrict it. Okay, so I have that, or I can just call it age at session. Okay, something like this. Okay, make sense? All right, then that's all the exercise I had for this session. And that pretty much is the conclusion of this session. I only have one more thing, which is a concluding remark for today's workshop and some overview of what's coming up tomorrow. So let's take a like, short break. I imagine, I'm guessing at the moment, like the longer break I take, I'm simply delaying the time you leave. So let's just take a pretty short break and then we'll come back and do a bit of a Last concluding remarks for the day one and a bit of a QA in this session. All right, so let's return in five minutes. Yes? I just had a question. Let's say, not, uh, so let's say session is sort of pretty high up in your hierarchy. Yep. It's very, and, and we've made the assumption at the very beginning of the session, there's only one session, only one session per day. Okay. And one of our, our primary keys is the session date. What if, let's say, halfway through this experiment, uh, if your PI says to you, you know what, I, I've been reading some papers and, and it sounds like there's some stark differences between you know, morning and evening sessions. So what I want you to do is now start doing some sessions in the morning, some sessions in the evening, and then run a couple of these mice twice a day just to see what happens. Mm -hmm. if, if you had to make a fairly large change to your pipeline, pipeline plan, yeah. how, how easy slash hard is that to do, uh, given that one of your, your dependencies very towards the right, right, pipeline right, yeah. Yeah, so as many things, the answer is it depends. Uh, but one of the key things, especially so if I were to take the scenario you just described, the, one of the issues then that comes up is, okay, like if you were to now start keeping track of say exact time the session was performed, so you can do multiple sessions in a day, are you able to actually take the old data and actually figure out exactly what the time is? Like do you actually even have enough specificity to keep the old data and migrate into the new chain in which session time is also part of the primary key. Sure. For right. the sake of argument, we'll just say it's morning and evening and we've done the experiments in the morning. Fair. Fair. So when you actually have a redesign like this, it can go in many ways. So as long as you actually have a good way to match your old design to the new design, just like the way you described, if you actually can know like how the new, like old entries can actually be defined uniquely under the new entry conditions, what you would typically do is actually go ahead and define your new pipeline according to the new definition and simply migrate over. There's actually a fairly straightforward insert from another table procedure you can perform. So rather than modifying the current pipeline, you, you just create a new pipeline and support overall the data? That's usually cleaner. 
Now, if it's like a tiny change where you don't have to keep on going down and like track for every single thing, then you could potentially imagine doing on the spot or per table like amendment. But especially if the change is in your primary key, you can imagine because everything cascades down. Everything that depends on something has their primary key and now your primary key, and this keeps on toppling down, it becomes really a big decision to make change of the primary key. And even if it's a compatible change, you encounter the issue like now you have to go one by one and try to make it all compatible. So rather than going through that effort and like really trying to fight the system, it's often just easier to treat this as one source under one scheme that you know how it meant, define new pipeline, define how is it that this should match to another just by defining how the insert should go and just run the insert from the old to the new pipeline. So that will be the typical recommendation. I don't know if Dimitri has more to add to it. Adding secondary attributes, so this non-primary key attributes, is usually not an issue, right? Deleting or modifying, uh, that's actually one thing I haven't covered. But deleting and modifying a secondary attributes or actually anything about your table is a pretty dangerous thing to do, especially if you're thinking about trying to do on-the-spot modification. Especially because if you think about it, for example, my spike detection depended on the activities data. Right, the spike, sorry, spikes depended on activity on the neuron table. If you decide that you're going to go and manually tweak that content of activity but don't do anything else, what you see how you have successfully created inconsistency in your whole pipeline. Your results that store in spikes is no longer in alignment with the activity field of the neuron it dependent on. So modification of an existing entry is usually a terrible idea. And, and population generally only detect missing entries, not modified entries. That's correct. Right. You wouldn't be able to detect the modified entries. That's right. So in those cases, what you want to do is simply drop the one that has to be modified, drop the entry. Let the cascading delete take care of to make sure everything that depended on the old value also be deleted. Insert the correct one and then recompute. Now, of course, there's case by case scenarios where you might consider that to be way too expensive. Or you might even say, like, okay, I'm just simply changing a value that no one else depends on. And we, of course, ultimately provide you with capacity to do that. But it's one of those things that really want to make sure because if if, maybe even, for example, like take the case of sex, right? You might not think no one, you might think no one depends on it. And you might like, feel like you can freely change it without harming anyone. But the more, the more, more people work on your pipeline, the more kind of analysis gets performed, it might not be the case. You might actually want to be quite uh, careful about such an operation. So hence, in general, we don't recommend update. You should try to delete the incorrect results or like now outdated entry. Let the cascade take place, insert the new entry, and if necessary, recompute. All right. Okay. All right. So that's pretty much it for day one of the workshop. It's been a pretty long day. We covered a lot. So definitely a lot of material that's really not the easiest to absorb, but hopefully. Now we have gained more familiarity of what the data pipeline and data journey is all about, and also hopefully gained some confidence in that, okay, you could probably try to use this, understand it, and maybe even see benefits of it. So, you know, as I said, we covered a lot. We designed our first data pipeline. Uh, we learned to insert, query, and fetch data, some of the more principled operations on data pipelines. We learned to define computations and, uh, as tables in data pipelines. So results of a computation is the thing, the entity that you want to represent as a computed table in your data pipeline. We computed statistics, and we computed spikes. So those are the things we computed. We also learned to use make and populate logic to trigger this whole cascade of population. It knows how to find the missing entries and go ahead and compute for you. That's one of the strengths of it. It's quite addictive as well. And we also have studied uh, studies, study com common design patterns in data pipeline. So at this point, I'd like to revisit the slide I had at one of the earlier points. And the point that, OK, data pipeline captures the relationship between things in your project. And now, hopefully, you recognize this was the very pipeline we designed. 
So um, you know, I didn't come up with this out of nowhere. So we had mouse, we had session, we recorded, we had neurons, we imported, we computed statistics like means and standard deviations, and we computed spikes that depend on some parameter theta, like store in spike detection parameter, I mean namely the threshold. Now so if I were to use more data joint like lingo, I would basically say data pipeline captures the dependency between entities in your project. And hopefully now this statement makes sense. I intentionally didn't use that statement, but hopefully this means something clear to you. Okay, so this is day one out of two day workshop, and I hope most of you can attend the workshop tomorrow. We start again at nine o'clock. And here's some overview of what we'll be covering. So tomorrow, unlike today, where you get to listen to me a lot, you actually will work in a team to, in the first session, practice designing a pipeline from scratch. So just like how I started with some prom definition, like a project definition, and we built slowly to build a whole pipeline, I'm gonna actually give you a practice scenario of an experiment and ask you to go design the pipeline. Now, I'm not gonna necessarily provide you with the whole data to ingest and then imp or import and compute off of, but I really just want you to focus on designing the pipeline, which means defining tables, thinking about the attributes, thinking about the data types, and thinking about the dependencies. In the second session tomorrow, we'll work on an ex extending an existing pipeline. So actually, we already saw a glimpse of it, the calcium pipeline, the big, maybe scary looking pipeline, that is the pipeline you get to work with. We'll study it a bit more, try to learn what is it that's representing, and then once we kind of have an idea of what is it representing, we actually gonna try to come out with a new analysis on top of it, extending the data pipeline. Finally, on the afternoon, we'll have a session covering some of the best practices, or more of like recommendations from us to you on how to go about sharing your data, sharing your code, and managing data slash code, both by yourself or across multiple people. Yeah, it could be within your lab, or maybe within a smaller team within your lab, or maybe across multiple labs. Same principle of best practices tend to apply. I will also cover good tools and technologies, of course, including data joint, but something, go, something even more on top that could be combined with data joint to achieve these points easily. All right, so, you know, this is, this is like a workshop aimed towards you know, giving you a condensed learning experience, but this is not your only learning resource. Data joint IO in general is a very good place for you to go and visit. This is where we have general information about the data joint and have links to our documentations and tutorials. And this will be, this is definitely work in progress, but we're definitely adding more to it. And as you work through it, your feedbacks are critical. Like they will really help us shape the tutorial, shape the documentation to make something better out of it. And also, I hope that everyone had a chance to join the Slack group. If not, then you can always still go to Data Join IO, scroll all the way to the down, there's a Slack sign up. Uh, this is usually a very good media by which you can get in contact with us or get in other people who are using Data Joint. And because of all the time zone differences and also weird hours that we work, usually there's someone 24 seven. So if you have a question, that's usually a pretty one of the best place to go. Just ask it away. And more likely than not, me or Dimitri be awake and we'll probably end up answering that question. Uh, for who, those of you who already done it, you know this is true. All right, so. Yeah, and then we're in general trying to add more and more resources. Ah, and then one thing to note is for this very workshop, I will be providing all the notebooks as well as like additional slides, for example, all the slides I had, and a couple other additional notes I have in general as one GitHub repository. I'm still not sharing with you because it has the material from tomorrow along with all the answer keys. So I will give that access and I'll email it out and also announce it on the data join channel as well as wherever I can find posting it. Uh, this also, also, this whole workshop was recorded, so unless you feel like watching it all over, perhaps it's not something you will wanna watch the whole thing, but maybe you wanna watch the whole uh, sections of it. But if you actually know someone who wanted to attend the workshop but haven't had a chance to do so, hopefully this is something you can share with them. 
All right, that's with that, that's it for day one. Thank you for attending.